I'm going to share today on the, a topic of praise. And, um, and um, you know, one of the discussions that's been around uh, longer than you or I has been um, church volume. Decibels. I have a friend who's a professional sound engineer, and his nickname is Dr. Decibel. <laughs> and uh, Sean tells me that people like us who do this for a living, uh, we, we have hearing loss. <laughs> and it's a, it's a fi fact. It's a scientific fact. But what... what Generally, we don't understand about the hearing and about the soul and about the connection of spirit realm and soul is there is something to be said for a loud sound. There's something to be said scripturally, theologically, and spiritually about the voice of many waters. There's something very powerful happens when you cry out with a loud voice. Uh, even karate instructors will understand this at a soulish level, not so much in a spirit realm, but in a soulish level when you give out that forceful verbal from your diaphragm. See, a lot of folks speak and sing from here, but you can tell a difference in someone singing from here and someone singing from here. I used to do vocal coaching, and I understand the physical aspects of that, but there's a spiritual aspect of giving a sound that's supported with your diaphragm, that you can't just do it from your neck or your head or your chest, but it comes from the support of your deepest place. There's a big old muscle there that pushes your lungs upward and gives you a sound, and, and that's why I can drown you out. <laughs> that's why I don't really need this microphone. <laughs> It, the microphone just makes it easy for me because you, you could hear me without it. And it picks up so the people at home can hear it. But there's, God is about to release a sound of praise in the earth. And he is actually, I, I shouldn't even say about to. He is releasing and has released a sound in the earth. It's, it's not a matter of if or when. It's only will you join the chorus of angels and give him your praise out of your mouth. Amen? There's a, there's a lot to be said for a whisper in the right time. There's a lot to be said for expository teaching like we do in our classrooms on, on uh, Wednesday nights and, and in our home grow groups that we have. We have 12 active grow groups. And if you want to be part of something big and powerful that's bigger than you and you're four and no more, get in one of the grow groups. You'll grow. Amen. But there's then something very special and very powerful about releasing your voice. I'll never forget um, Hannah. Is Hannah in here? Is she teaching? Where are you at, Hannah? My worship leader right there. Hannah came and Paula laid hands on her one night over in the old barn. And she got up from the altar. No one was here, but I think it was just the three of us. And she got up from the altar, and she picked up the microphone, and Paula started playing a simple chorus, and she began to sing, and as she did, she started to weep. Because God, through the Spirit, released 
her voice and she said, it's the first time I've heard myself sing. Now, obviously she had sung in the car and, uh, you know, out in the yard planting flowers and all those kinds of times, but there was something else that was unlocked in deep within the soul that was released into the atmosphere. And when she heard it, something happened to her in the spirit realm. And that's what God wants to do with every one of us. He wants you to find your voice. And the enemy is a liar. He doesn't want you to find your voice. He wants... Huh. Some church governments have put themselves in power over and above the authority of Almighty God and have told the preacher not to speak so loud. There's churches who have boards sitting around deciding how many decibels can happen in the room. Amen? But I'm going to tell you something. When God sets your voice free and you begin to shout with a voice of triumph, the enemy knows who's winning by the sound of your triumph. Hallelujah. You go to a sporting event, you can tell which team is winning by which color is standing up screaming. Amen? We're at a pivotal time in our nation. We're at a pivotal time in our church. We're at a pivotal time in our world where the people who are winning need to be the loudest. Because we are winning. That loud mouth bunch of liberals, that loud mouth bunch of the world that wants to drag us into all kinds of immorality and sin. They need to shut up and sit down and God's people need to arise like a mighty army. We need to be heard in the earth. God is going to give you a voice. Hear me, man of God. God wants to give you a voice. Hallelujah. And we're not going to be quiet. And we're not going to stop screaming. And we're not going to stop shouting. And we're not going to turn it down. We're going to turn it up. Wow. Hallelujah. You can be seated. My friend, Matt Rice, he'll, he'll probably see this video and laugh. But I remember when Jordan, his oldest son, started into kindergarten and they went around the room and they introduced themselves and they asked, the teacher asked, what does your daddy do? And so the little boys were, you know, my daddy's a doctor, my daddy's a firefighter, my daddy's a police officer, whatever. And they got to Jordan, said, what does your daddy do? Now he's a pastor. He said, uh, my daddy screams at people. And if he does good, they scream back. I said, that pretty much sums it up. <laughs> Amen. Well, I don't believe you have to scream to be heard. But I believe in a voice of authority. And I believe there's a time to thunder. And there's a time when your praise can turn your situation around. And it's time for some of us to stop whispering, stop whining. Oh, pastor, don't be so hard on them. I don't know why, but God, he gives so much grace. And he's graced me with a lot of grace on a lot of things. But for some reason, Joe, he's held back from me grace for whining. I just don't have that grace. 
I work a lot of teenagers in my crews when we do construction, and I, I go off this litany whenever one of them says something negative. I say, there's not going to be any whining or belly aching or complaining or murmuring or grumbling or moaning or groaning. And I just go on and on. Uh, and, and, and it gets funny, you know. And, of course, I'm joking. But, Jeb, we just don't put up with whining, do we? No. It's like, my back hurts. Stop it. We don't care. We, we just don't. We're not going to, you know, pamper you right now. We're getting the job done. Uh, but the church of the living God is, is, is real. And there's a remnant rising up. And if, if you're looking at numbers, you know, it's just all over the place. God never called a majority to get it done. He never needed masses and multitudes to get things done. He's God, and he can take one little boy and turn a whole army around. He can take one jawbone and kill thousands. He can take 300 and put 100,000 turning on themselves and turning around and give victory in the most inopportune moments. But there's a real enemy that would like to do everything in his power to take down America and take down the nations who are free and the nations who support America and the nations who support the gospel of Jesus Christ. Freedom was given to this country miraculously. Read your history. Read the real history. Don't read the revision garbage. And I could use other words. Uh, but... Read the real history. There were miracles because people prayed that happened, and it's miraculous that we are here today in a free country, and we're going to fight and do everything in our power to keep it free because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was for the gospel. It was for praise to be lifted up in the land that we were freed. It was, our founders had no intention of freeing us from the tyranny of the British so we could be enslaved again by sin or by a demonic government. That was not their intention at all. The high price the American soldier has paid for your freedom and mine should never be squandered by our laziness, complacency, or our stinking pride. We should never be silent. We should never be quarantined. We should never be separated from the house of worship by man or any law of the land. This is God's house. And several people came up to me today with words to speak, and, and I have to kind of sift through and see what the Holy Spirit wants, and we may have a word or two here before we leave today, but Danny Davis come up here and he said, the Lord says to let the people know this house is not the only place where he is. This is not, it's not all about what goes on in this room, something like that. Right, Danny? It's the people. Not the building, but the people. And people need to come together. And we're going to have church again in the prison. We're going to have church again on the street. We're going to have church again at the gazebo. We're going to have church again at the church. Too many church buildings are empty right now. God's going to fill them up. God wants to raise up some of you to go take over them empty buildings and start a church. Glory to God. Somebody say amen. amen. The greatest price of freedom was prayed 2,000 years ago, and I will not squander it. I will not let it go unnoticed, 
or without recognition. Turn to Romans chapter 8 and I'll begin. The message of the Lord from the Passion Translation, Romans 8:18, 8, reading through verse 28. So hold on, here we go. I am convinced that any suffering we endure is less than nothing compared to the magnitude of glory that is about to be unveiled within us. The entire universe is standing on tiptoe, yearning to see the unveiling of God's glorious sons and daughters. For against its will, the universe itself has had to endure the empty futility resulting from the consequences of human sin. A little bit louder. But now, with eager expectation, all creation longs for freedom from its slavery to decay and to experience with us the wonderful freedom coming to God's children. To this day, we are aware of the universal agony and groaning of creation as if it were in the con contractions of labor for childbirth. And it's not just creation. We who have already experienced the first fruits of the Spirit also outwardly groan as we passionately long to experience our full status as God's sons and daughters, including our physical bodies being transformed. Amen? For this is the hope of our salvation, but hope means that we must trust and wait for what is still unseen. For why would we need to hope for something we already have? So because our hope is set on what is yet to be seen, we patiently keep waiting for its fulfillment. And in a similar way, the Holy Spirit takes hold of us in our human frailty to empower us in our weaknesses. For example, at times we don't know how to pray or know the best things to ask for. But the Holy Spirit, that blessed gift, accompanied by an unknown tongue, rises up within us to super intercede on our behalf, pleading to God with emotional sighs too deep for words. I want to sow a seed in somebody's heart here today. You've never prayed this kind of prayer right here. The earnest groanings that cannot be uttered with your own human tongue, but you allow God to groan through you. You allow God to use you as a vessel of intercession, a vessel that goes in between, a vessel that will weep between the porch and the altar, the Old Testament says, a vessel who will get a hold of the horns of the altar, the Bible talks about. You gotta, sometimes you've got to physically get in a position, get a hold of something, and bear down and pray. Not begging God, but just getting your own spirit man in a posture and in a position where you can take a stand, where you can get some grit and say, Devil, you are a liar. I will not be defeated. I will not be denied. My God is king over all the earth. And you get the word in front of you and you begin to groan and the Holy Spirit takes over and stuff comes out of your mouth you don't understand and you just go with it and you birth things in the spirit it's talking about right here. The Holy Spirit passionately pleads before God for us, his holy ones, in perfect harmony with God's plan and our destiny. Now we come to the verse that we all like to quote when trouble comes, but we don't get to 28 if you don't read 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. I can still count. Thank God. I learned that in public school. <laughs> Maybe before public school, actually. Hopefully. And then we like this one. We, th remember now, this has been groaning. It's been birthing pains. This is, this is coming through some, some very powerful and tough stuff. So we are convinced 
that every detail of our lives is continually woven together to fit into God's perfect plan of bringing good. The, the King James says, for we know that all things work together for good. For we are his lovers who have been called to fulfill his designed purpose. Look at somebody and say, your purpose is greater than your pain. Reminded of the old song we sang, I will praise him, I will praise him, praise the lamb for sinners slain. Give him glory, all ye people, for his blood can wash away each stain. In Exodus 15, verse 11, the writer says, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Perhaps the one person who had the greatest appreciation for the cross lived 1,100 years before the cross had happened in the earth. King David, he had a revelation that transcended time. He had a revelation that even though he was in the Old Testament, he was not of the Old Testament. He was a king born out of season. He was a, a man, a worshiper, who understood and related to God in a whole lot more of a new covenant kind of experience because he spoke of mercy and grace in time before Jesus had given his life, before there was an eternal sacrifice made. David got a hold of that in a time when he had to make sacrifice every year to just roll it ahead. But he could see 1,100 years down the road that it was being rolled ahead. But one day it was going to be rolled ahead for good. One day it was going to be done, finished the work. That the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world was going to come and be made into a man like us and be the sacrifice. And no more do we have to offer the blood of bulls and goats and turtle doves and lambs, but Jesus has become my sacrifice for my sin. And David, I believe, had a revelation. Somehow he prophetically saw this, the shepherd boy who became prophet, priest, and king by three special anointings in his life. David, little David, as we call him, became King David, prophet to the nations, prophet to me. I love reading his prophecies in the Psalms about Jesus coming. He couldn't see it with these eyes, but the Spirit let him in on it. In 2 Samuel 22, if you'll go there, You'll find David in a season of his latter years. You'll find him in a place where the mighty men around him had kind of put him out to pasture, if you will. But I want you to read here, here as we read 2 Samuel 22 and verse 4. It's a lengthy passage here today. It says, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. When the waves of death surrounded me, the floods of ungodliness made me afraid. The sorrows of Sheol surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. How many want to be like David? 
and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple, and my cry entered his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. If you don't think praise and prayer moves things and makes a difference, pay attention here closely. The foundations of heaven quaked and were shaken. That's the kind of prayer life I want to have. Because he was angry, smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down with darkness under his feet. He rode upon a cherub and flew, and he was seen upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness canopies around him, dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. From the brightness before him, coals of fire were kindled. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice. He sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning bolts, and he vanquished them. Then the channels of the sea were seen. The foundations of the world were uncovered at the rebuke of the Lord, at the blast of the breath of his nostrils. He sent from above. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity. But the Lord was my support. He also brought me out into a broad place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. Somebody needs to get that today. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. He has recompensed me for I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his judgments were before me and for his statutes I did not depart from them. Here's a man that's speaking years and years after he had committed gross and grave sins. But he was able to say, I've not departed from them. That's a grace that the Old Testament did not have. But David tapped into it somehow in his praise and in his prophetic being. He knew he was blameless before God. The Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his eyes. With a merciful, you will show yourself merciful. With a blameless man, you will show yourself blameless. With the pure, you will show yourself pure. With the devious, you will show yourself shrewd. You will save the humble people, but your eyes are on the haughty that you may bring them down. For you are my lamp, O Lord. The Lord shall enlighten my darkness. For by you I can run against a troop. By my God I can leap over a wall. The Lord lives. Blessed be my rock. Let God be exalted, the rock of my salvation. Yes. Go ahead and praise him about that right there. By you. I can run over a troop and jump over a wall. Woo! Yeah, give me one of them Indian war hoops. Woo! <laughs> I love it. Thank you, Jesus. Now, go back with me to 2 Samuel 21. One chapter back. Turn left in your Bible. In verse 17. They just come out of a battle here, and Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, came to his aid and struck the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swore to him, saying, You shall go out no more with us to battle, lest you quench the lamp. Of Israel. Israel been in a famine for three years. The king, David, had watched the people suffer. The king had fought and won 
battle after battle after battle. He could still remember hearing the ladies singing with their tambourines, Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his ten thousands. And he goes out to war, and he's confronted, and somebody has to come in and step in and fight because David is getting old, he's getting weak. And they come to David and they said to David, you're not going out no more. We got your back. And it, we don't want you going out because you might quench the lamp of Israel. And in chapter 22, <laughs> David, he's not crying in his beer. He's not holed up in a cave somewhere. In chapter 22, he says, For you, O Lord, are my lamp. The Lord shall enlighten my darkness. Come on. Don't you give up. Don't you let anybody tell you your days are over. Don't you let anybody tell you you're going to quench the lamp. Hey! <laughs> David comes right back and writes a song, one of the best songs he ever wrote. He wrote after they told him to sit down and shut up. <laughs> Come on, somebody. I love David. He says, you're the lamp, O Lord. You'll enlighten my darkness. I'm not worried about quenching any lamp. I'm going to praise you, Lord. He says, for by you, I can run through a troop. Don't tell me I ain't going out to battle. Hey. And by you, I can leap over a wall. The Lord lives. Blessed be my rock. Let God be exalted. Now look at verse 50. Therefore, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the Gentiles, and sing praises to your name. He is the tower of salvation to his king and shows mercy to his anointed, to David and his descendants forevermore. Ain't nobody going to take my place. Ain't nobody going to quench the lamp that's in me. Remember, just a few weeks ago, we celebrated Palm Sunday, the Sunday we set aside to lead us into Passover, the crucifixion, and to lead us into the Resurrection Sunday. And we talked about how they praised the Lord in the street. Remember, one of the parts of that story, I think, has been a whole lot of worship services started with is the part where the children were crying out and somebody said, Jesus, won't you tell them to be quiet? He said, if they hold their peace, if these hold their peace, the rocks are going to cry out. Look at somebody right now and say, ain't no rock going to take my place. I don't care if you're from Mississippi or not. You can say ain't. Sometimes it's just, sometimes Mississippi is a little stronger than good English. There isn't any rock going to take my place. Just don't have the same unction. Ain't no rock going to take my place. We used to sing an old song, here is one less stone, one more voice. To praise the mighty name, the name of my Lord. David Huff wrote that song. I want to be one less stone. I'm going to be one less st I may not make a great splash in the earth. I may not ever be a millionaire. I may not ever be famous. I may not ever be in lights or write a book or whatever. I did write one book. But, <laughs> oh well. But I'm going to be that one. Amen. I'm not going to let a rock take my place. Here, after three years of famine, here after defeat and in David's mind, here after getting his, his surrounding influences telling him to go sit down, David writes this powerful chapter, and there's nine quick points here. Number one, he says, I will. I will. See, a lot of us need to get up on Sunday morning and, and put our feet on the floor and open our mouth and real loud say, I will. I will. Huh? You, you need to let the atmosphere and the cat 
Amen? Everything in your house needs to hear you say, I will bless the Lord. I will praise God while there is breath in my being. I will walk in them back doors, look at somebody and say, I will. I will sing out loud. I will pray in the Holy Ghost. I will heal the sick. I will raise the dead. I will tell of his goodness. I will walk in victory. I will see my children saved. Get our will involved. And the second thing he did was he asked, who is the Lord? And he starts to tell who God is. He's the deliverer. He's the God that answers. He's the God that hears. Amen? He says, I will call. I will praise. I will be saved. The fourth thing he said was, I cried in fear and he heard me. The fifth thing that happened in this chapter, the Lord's rebuke uncovers the wicked. Are you... If you see or hear any hint of the news in the earth, God is uncovering the wicked. And judgment begins at the house of God. And there's some stuff going on that's coming down. Amen? And you're going to see it. You're gonna, it's going to be uncovered and light's going to hit it. And when light hits darkness, the darkness never wins. Never wins. Never wins. Never. Amen. And the light I'm talking about doesn't need a Duracell. Huh? You think the sun's bright. The Bible said his, bright, his brightness is brighter than the noonday sun. He's shining right now. Number six, but God. There's a but God in this chapter. David talks about, and he says, he rescued me. He turned light on the wicked, but he rescued me. He delivered me because he delighted in me. Number seven, he rewarded me because I kept his commandments. Hey, this business of live any way you want to and just trust God and, you know, I'm, I'm a Christian because I got the fish on the back of my minivan. That's not going to cut it. If you want to be part of this army, if you want to be the one he delivers, the one he delights in, you need to keep his commandments. That's not old school. That's the only school. Amen? The Ten Commandments are not outdated. They're eternal, and they work, and they're for your protection. They're not mean. They're for your protection. That thou shalt not steal thing, I like that. I really do. Because I like my stuff, and, and I like you having your stuff. Amen? And I don't want to trade stuff with you. You keep your stuff, I'll keep my stuff. I would rather give you my stuff than you steal my stuff. That's a good way to live, isn't it? Ten Commandments are cool. They work. Amen? I'll keep my wife, you keep your wife. It's the Ten Commandments. Love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Have no other gods before me. That's a cool commandment. Because if you ever put another god before him, it's going to burn. It's going to crumble. Them other gods you think are cool, they're not cool. They're weak. They're pitiful. And they're coming down. So that the commandments are just really awesome. Keep his commandments. Number eight, to the merciful... He shows mercy to the pure. He appears before them as pure. Amen. To the blameless, God is blameless. See, the people that hate God, the people that say there is no God, it's, the, the Bible says the fool has said in his heart there is no God. Now, that's, not, that's, not a, that's not a slam to atheists. It's just, it's just simply saying that somebody who would say there is no God has got something wrong inside them. To the pure, he's pure. So the pure in heart shall see God, the real God. 
All you got to do is ask an atheist, tell me about the God that you say don't exist. Well, first of all, if he don't exist, they can't tell you about him. There's nothing to say, but they will immediately start telling you about the God they don't believe in. And 99% of the time, you will agree with them. When they start saying things like, I don't believe in a God that would let the, you know, Jews be killed and blah, blah, blah. I don't believe in a God that would kill babies and da, 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 They've always got this God in their mind that didn't do it like they like it. You say, you know what? I think I agree with you. I don't believe in that God either. Let me tell you about the God I do believe in. And then you can talk to them about the Creator, a loving God who's with you in trouble, who carries... Amen? Get my Helen Keller book, you know? Corey Ten Boom book, you know? Amen? And, and that, that God they describe is, is no... To the devious, he, he seems shrewd. He comes across as a bad, mean God to the people who have that, that eye. That's what they're looking for. It's putting the murder weapon in God's hand. I don't know why God took my grandpa. I don't know why God took my dad. I don't know why God took my wife. That, put that murder weapon in God's hand, and that's the God you know. But if you can turn it around and say, you know what? God was with me when I was raped. God was with me when I was abused as a child. God was right there, and he kept me, and he brought me out of it. He's a loving God. He's a good God. He's a very present help in trouble. Amen? And then the ninth point is, for you are my lamp, O Lord. You are my lamp, O oh Lord. Oh, my, it's a dark world. Yes. <laughs> I had someone uh, I was talking to a few days ago, and um, I shared a testimony, and they said, well, you just don't know how dark it is in the inner city because I live in Fairfield County where it's so bright and nobody sins over here. <laughs> we don't have anybody doing meth or... You know, we don't even need police, and you know, <laughs> wrong, amen. And yes, I do know how dark it is in downtown, and I bet you Richie could tell you some dark stories about downtown Columbus and the inner city. But I do know, I don't need to know how dark it is because I know the light, and it doesn't matter how dark it is when the light hits it. It's, it's done. Amen? Somebody say, praise the Lord. For you are my lamp, O Lord. If you will come, we're going to uh, share a couple of verses. So, in 1994, I was diagnosed with diabetes. And for three years, I fasted and prayed and trusted God for a miracle that I'm still believing for today. So that part of the story, I'll just go ahead and give you the end part of the story. Amen? But in the process, over about three years of that famine for me, of three years of seeking the Lord and trusting God, I went from about 185 or 90 pounds to 129 pounds. So literally, I wore layers of clothing so people didn't gasp when they saw me in public. I had to sleep with a pillow between my legs because my legs were so bony they couldn't touch each other without pain. I had neuropathy in my feet. I had to lace up nine-inch work boots all the way up my legs to get any relief from the pain at night when I slept. I built a platform on Eagle Rock Church, designed and built it all on my knees because I couldn't walk. I walk into the building, get on my knees, put the, tape, the uh, miter saw on the floor. I'm not trying to get you to feel sorry for me. I just want you to know that I went through a hard time. I put the miter saw on the floor, and the guys brought the, 
the wood to me and I did all the cutting and we, we built that and constructed the platform for that church and I had so much pain in my feet I had to do it for my knees. Somebody say, but God. But God. At 129 pounds, I got an infection and I couldn't, basically couldn't get out of bed and I was pretty determined not to go to the doctor praying and trusting and believing God. A dear friend of mine named Keith Breesocker came over to my house and he just started pushing people out of the way. His wife was one of our intercessors and he said, you go over there and pray. I'm taking him to the hospital. He picked me up literally and carried me and put me in the car, called 911, told him he, we were on our way, pulled into the hospital. He said, I, I don't need a wheelchair. I need a stretcher. He got their attention. They took me in. When the doctor checked me out, he said, you had 24 hours to live. I remember they gave me medications and all of a sudden my body reacted negatively to it. I began to get real sick. So they put a shot of Finnegan in me. And they must have given me a shot for a 250 pound man because I was six foot two and they, I don't know what they did, but they gave me too much. I went in a coma and I woke up out of that coma and I remember the word of the Lord came to me and the word of the Lord that came to me was Psalm chapter 30 and verse nine. What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it declare your truth? We had just started the river. We were a couple years into that. And I was the pastor and the speaker on Sunday. And I just looked at God and I said, If I die here, will my dust praise you? I had enough confidence in God and his delight in me and how valuable my praise was to him that I put it on the table and I said, my dust can't do what I'm about to do over the next 40, 50 years on the planet earth. My dust can't preach. My dust can't sing. My dust can't give praise. And God raised me up out of that bed. I left the hospital at 150 pounds. Uh, someone prophesied over me when I was at 129 pounds at a church meeting we went to, and they didn't know me from Adam. But they just walked up and put their hand on me and said, God's about to put 60 pounds on you. And he did. Uh, how many believe in the word of the Lord? Amen. I stand here today in perfect health. I don't have any medical issues whatsoever. Praise God. I believe God for completely healing my diabetes, but I'm, my A1C is perfect. I'm in good shape. And I can work alongside most 61-year-olds for a little bit. Hallelujah. <laughs> so, before any rock starts thinking they can take my place, I got news. Amen. I got something to say about that. Mike, there's no rock going to take your place. I want you to be loud in the presence of God. God wants to give you a voice. Chris, you're not done dancing across here screaming and carrying on. And and wherever whatever pulpit God has, ain't no rock can do what God called Chris Bookman to do. Hallelujah. Lois, there ain't no rock, no boulder, no nothing. No piece of granite, nowhere 
can do what you're doing and about to do. Where's Ron Mason? Stand up, Ron Mason. The word of the Lord says God wants to raise up your voice again. Something inside of you is being resurrected. This is your resurrection day. Preach the word. Preach the word. Heal the sick. Hallelujah. I remember standing at his bedside when the, his blood pressure was like 200 or something. And they said, we can't get it down. We don't know what to do. I said, I know what to do. Hallelujah. I laid hands on him, prayed for him. I said, check it again. They checked it and they said, blood pressure came down to normal. What's going on? Amen. God's not done with you. Terry, we're just getting started. Listen to me. The nation needs to hear you. It's bigger than you think it is. It's greater than you think it is. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Stand to your feet. Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery. And in Genesis chapter 50 and verse 18, his brothers came and fell down before his face. And they said... Behold, we are your servants. Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me. I, I can't hear you. But God, but God, but God, meant it for good. Somebody standing in this room today. Stuff has come against you. Disease. Illness. Infirmity. Affliction. Negative words. Criticism. Death in your family. Divorce. Whew. My God. Debt, despair, depression. Somebody watching me online. We're just about to close this out. I want to pray for you, and they're going to bring us a song. We're going to shout in this room. If you're watching online before we turn this off, I want to pray for everyone in this room. Bow your head, close your eyes, hold on to your spouse if she's nearby. Father, in the name of Jesus, I call on your name. For everyone that's hearing my voice today, everyone that's heard the word of the Lord, a shout of praise is going up right now in somebody's living room. A shout of praise is going up right now in this house. And God, I believe and trust you, Lord, that every soul that is lost and don't know you will not leave this room and will not leave this service and will not close out this video without knowing the power and deliverance of God in their life. You died to save us and that blood is real today it's a right now experience and we trust you and we believe you for every victory because what the enemy meant for evil you turned it for good in Jesus name I want you to shout it shout it hallelujah glory to God glory 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 glory